none is known. And we are moving straight on to three presentations from the Arafa, some of the Arafa, or three of the Arafa entities. And first up, we ask for Vern to come up, I think. Do you want to just come up and introduce anything, Vern? There's to acknowledge the support of uh, Auckland Council and for them to highlight to you um, some of the fantastic work that they are doing in the region uh, uh, thanks to the support of the Auckland Council. So I think I'll allow them to uh, self-introduce if that's okay, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Vern. Right, so um, start on with David and Carol, or is it? Yes, we have both. Yeah, welcome. Kia ora and good morning councillors. My name is David Holdsworth and I'm the Chief Executive of Stardome, the Auckland Observatory and Planetarium. I'd like to thank councillors for um, inviting us here this morning to update you on what's been happening at Stardome over the last 12 months. First, I'd like to pass on an apology from uh, Richard Sorensen, the Chair of our Trust Board, who is currently overseas and obviously not able to attend today's presentation. Um, I'd also, however, like to introduce Carol Gernhofer, who is um, one of our trustees and is chair of our um, Audit and Risk Committee. Um, Welcome. Sure. <clears throat> uh, Stardome is, um, is the largest planetarium in New Zealand and a leading uh, provider of astronomical and space-related education information and material throughout New Zealand. Stardome has been located on, in One Tree Hill Domain at the foot of Maunga Kiakia for more than 50 years. And during that time, we have proudly shared our love of space with the citizens of Auckland. As many of you will be aware, most major cities around the world, and certainly all of the cities considered to be among the world's most livable cities, have a planetarium as part of the cultural fabric of the city, alongside their museums, art galleries, etc. As I've noted in the past, Auckland is particularly fortunate in having a world-class planetarium located on the slopes of Maunga Kia, Kia one of the most iconic volcanic cones in our city. Stardome's facilities comprise a world-class planetarium where visitors can see shows about space and the universe in an immersive 360-degree dome theatre. Astronomical and educational displays and exhibits in the foyer and public areas a publicly accessible observatory where visitors can actually view planets and constellations, and a world-rated astronomical research facility where our volunteers utilise the telescopes on site to contribute to international studies and observations. <coughs> Excuse me. We also have a uh, number David, of... David, just have Carol turn her, your, your, your speaker off. Off. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yep. No, the other button. Yep, all good. <coughs> Sorry. Um, sorry. <clears throat> sorry, we also have a number of spaces that we can hire out for a range of activities such as corporate venue hire, children's birthday parties and even weddings to produce additional revenue to support our core activities. In addition to its astronomical focus, Stardome has introduced a range of non-astronomical shows and diverse programs over the past few years, such as music shows, science sci-fi nights and Valentine's nights to broaden our customer base, to attract a, a wider audience from throughout the Auckland region and to broaden our uh, revenue sources. In the past year, Stardome was closed for two weeks to allow an upgrade to our planetarium technology. This project included an upgrade to the operating system that runs our planetarium to the world-leading Evans and Sutherland D6 system, which has significant rendering improvements and more astronomy data to include in our night sky tours. At the same time, we installed two new laser projectors, which deliver high contrast 4K images on the dome and will also result in significant operational cost savings, as we will not have to continually replace the lamps, which cost over $2,000 each. We're about to have a further technology upgrade with the replacement of our planetarium audio system and the replacement of our uninterrupted power supply system. 
These upgrades will both improve Stardome's ability to provide planetarium and live music shows, but also will future-proof our system against technology failure for many years to come. Uh, we would like to note that none of these technology upgrades would have been possible without the financial support from Auckland Council through Regional Facilities Auckland. So thank you very much for that. Um, in September last year, our historic large Zeiss telescope was decommissioned to allow for a much needed technology upgrade. When completed, this upgrade will make the telescope better for public viewing and better for our astronomy research as it will allow our researchers remote access to the instrument. The highlight of a visit to Stardome is our planetarium, where visitors enjoy an out-of-this-world experience. Lying back in the reclining seats and looking up at the 360-degree dome screen, visited, visitors are transported away from Earth to discover the, the wonders of the universe and exploring the big questions in science. How big is the universe? How did we get here? And of course, the really big one, are we alone? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the answer to that yet. Um, we are currently engaged in a project to introduce more local and more cultural content into our planetarium shows, and Stardom has invested significant funds in two homegrown planetarium shows, both of which made their debuts in the past 12 months. The Great Walker, produced in conjunction with Wellington-based Ohu Domes, was added to our Matariki Dawn show, screening in June and July to public and year-round to education groups. The Stardome produced seasonal series, Stories in the Sky, also debu debuted in the past year, and this explores the night sky through ancient Greek and Maori myths and legends. Stardome really shines when there are astronomical events happening, and we were particularly fortunate in the last year with two major celestial events occurring, which Stardome used as an opportunity to excite and educate the public of Auckland on astronomy. The January 2019 lunar eclipse saw over 1,800 visitors come through Stardome during a, a one, uh, one open night and an overwhelming 37% increase in our website traffic. Mid-2018 saw the close approach of Mars, and while a Martian dust storm obscured some of our viewing, the public were no less engaged, with over 2,500 people visiting us during one night, the Night of Opposition. The resources and content we produced around these two events are still available online, and our analytics show that they are frequent, frequent, frequented daily, helping to continue to position Stardome as thought leaders and subject experts in the field. Education remains a pillar of Stardome's identity, with over 45,000 schoolchildren coming through our educational programs in the past year. Regional amenities funding in support of our low decile and southern initiative programs has meant that, st meant that the Stardome education programs can reach students in some of the lower socioeconomic areas of Auckland. It is worth noting that since its, ex since its inception, 96,000 children from lower decile schools in the Auckland region have visited Stardome, many of whom would otherwise not have been able to make these visits. The number of preschool and Kohangareo children, uh, students who visited Stardome in the last year was almost 10,000. Um, and and at the most popular time of year, of course, is our Matariki season, where we have about 12,000 students visit in that period alone. Our school holiday sessions run by our education team continues to grow in popularity with almost 11,000 children enjoying these four programs during the course of a year. During the last year, we had around 152,000 visitors at Stardom, and although this was slightly below the number of visitors in the previous year, due mainly to the fact that we were closed for two weeks for the technology upgrade previously referred to, this is still a significant number of visitors to such a small facility as Stardom. Our long-standing residency at the foot of Monga Kia Kia gives us a unique connection to Maori culture and the local iwi, and we plan to work more closely with the iwi of Auckland in the future to incorporate more Maori and cultural content into our programs. With approximately 95% of our visitors coming from Auckland region, and with over 65% of our visitors being children, Stardome is committed to supporting the objectives of the Auckland plan. 
As previously noted, Stardome's lease on our current location expires in 2025, and we are currently working with the Monga team at Auckland Council to extend the term of our lease and to give our organisation certainty about its location into the future. As councillors will be aware, Stardome was one of the five Auckland cultural heritage sector institutions which were subject to the review by Stafford strategy last year. And we have been working recently with, other, with the other cultural sector institutions and Auckland Council offices to finalise the terms of reference for stage two of the proposed council review of the cultural sector, um, which I believe will be considered by council in the near future. We look forward to working with council and the other cultural sector institutions in the months ahead to see if there is a better way for council to get better value for the significant investment it makes in the cultural sector of Auckland. I should also like to note that we have worked closely with the other main culture, cultural sector, cultural heritage sector organisations of Auckland on the MOA, the Museums of Auckland initiative, which is already leading to greater cooperation across a range of projects between the various cultural sector organisations of Auckland. In conclusion, however, I would like to say that I believe that without regional amenities funding, it is highly likely that Stardome would no longer exist, and it certainly would not be able to provide the citizens of Auckland with the benefits that the facility currently provides. Regional amenities funding has underwritten the sustainability and financial security of Stardome, and it has allowed for the provision of a world-class observatory and planetarium open to the public of Auckland seven days a week. Carol. Thank you, David. Just wanted to say thank, thank you on behalf of Auckland, of Stardome, the Auckland Reservatory and Planetarium Trust Board, to Regional Amenities Funding Board, Regional Facilities Auckland and Auckland Council for their ongoing support of Stardome. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognise the Stardome team and volunteers and the fellow Trust Board members for their time. And we look forward to continuing to share our knowledge of space and wonders of the universe with the citizens and children of Auckland in the ways that inspire, challenge and educate. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Cathy. The first thing is that I, I'm a member of the Tupunamonga Authority, so I declare an interest in the lease issues. I forgot. Um, my questions all relate to how you work with the other CCOs that we have, like ATED and RFA, that's one question. And the other is, with regard to the low decile schools, how do you get them there? How do you make it so that everybody gets a chance? Sure. Uh, well, the first one, um, it'd probably be fair to say that our, we don't work as closely with ATED as we would like to. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, I don't know whether it's our fault or 18's fault or whatever, but I think there's a slightly different focus, but we are now, that is now coming more into focus as a result of the cultural sector review. Um, so I think in the future there will be a much greater um, interaction with 18. Um, and the second question, um, we... Auckland? Sorry? Regional Facilities Auckland? Yes. We work very closely with regional facilities, Auckland, yeah, I did refer to them um, in my presentation. We have a very close relationship with regional facilities, Auckland. We meet them on a regular basis and they do give us um, very good support. Um, as I said, that the, um, the capital funding projects that we had wouldn't have taken place if we hadn't have got the support of um, regional facilities, Auckland, and uh, which was uh, funds that came through the Auckland, Auckland long-term plan. So um, the, the second question, we, we make our programs available to all the low decile schools of Auckland. We don't, we don't um, try and um, uh, we don't try and pick and choose. Um, we can't say which ones come. We leave it up to them to take advantage of the programs that we have on offer. But they are available to all um, low decile schools in Auckland. Um, so. Historically, we've also applied for transport funding for lower decile schools mm. to get. There, because the biggest cost on the school trips is actually getting there for them and getting enough adults per child on the bus, etc. as well. So we've we looked at other ways to make it more accessible too. Mm. Yep. Third question is, what did you do on Valentine's night? Well, <laughs> well it's, it's, it's our most profitable <laughs> night of the year, to be honest. We have a... Um, we had five fully sold out sessions from about 5 o'clock to 11 o'clock at night. Um, we charge $150 a couple, which is uh, stunningly uh, good, and, uh, and we give them a, a little pack with a few goodies in it, including a bottle of champagne and a couple of glasses. 
um, and we put on a, a planetarium show which focuses on the romantic aspects of space and planets and, and so on and, and stories and, uh, and it's continued to grow in popularity. So uh, if anybody, anybody feels uh, inclined to, uh, for a romantic night, um, we, yeah. It's a half price if you come along by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to buy I think, one ticket. I think, I, think, I think we'd probably charge double if you're, if you're so sad that you have to come along on your own. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you do reruns of, what was it, George Clooney and Sandra Bullock? <laughs> um, we do reruns of old movies, yeah. I'm yeah. not sure about George Clooney, but we do, we do have um, sci-fi nights once a month where we get old, old, um, old movies. They're some, sometimes hard to get because the uh, companies that own them are not too keen to give them up, but we do have old sci-fi nights, old movie sci-fi nights. You've also worked with the arts festival as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't talk. mention that, but we, we, for the first time this year, we, um, we, we worked with the Auckland Arts Festival and we had a, um, four nights where we had a musician playing live music in the planetarium. And, uh, and we were one of the two, um, we were told by the Arts Festival that we were one of the two events that were fully sold out through the mm -hmm. course of the um, Arts Festival. So it's something we want to work on in the future yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and improving because live music is a great opportunity for yeah. us to have the live music with the planetarium, with images on the dome and, uh, and so on. So, yeah. Very good. Any further questions, no? observations? No? Well, thank you very much. And thank we you, really thank like you very much for your time. Valentine's story. We'll turn this, we'll turn this off. Thank yeah, you. We'll see you, on, we'll see you on the 14th of February next year. So we're not these romantic nights, folks? 14th of February is Valentine's night. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, we, um, we, oh, oh, I just heard, I just heard, I just heard the dulcet tones of John Tommy here. We, um, <laughs> we, I think he's single. <laughs> we do sometimes actually have special uh, romantic evenings, and we've had a number of people who've proposed to their partners under the stars in the planetarium. So we can put on a special uh, show if you're feeling that way inclined. So. <laughs> but I'll, I'll rescue the situation. I think it could be you don't know who to take. That would be what it is. That's right. That's right. There you are. That's what I really Thank think. Thank you, Council. Yeah. <laughs> right. We now um, we now have Callum and Roy from the Coast Guard Northern Region. Welcome. Yep. Thank you. Oh, press the, uh, just press the button. Yep, that's it. On behalf of Coast Guard Northern Region, thank you very much uh, for your invitation to attend this morning's uh, committee session. I'm joined by uh, Mr. Roy Savage, uh, who's a board member, uh, and I have no romantic involvement with Roy, just to be clear. <laughs> um, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, together, we look forward to updating you on uh, Coast Guard Northern Region's performance over the last 12 months and to answer any questions you've got. So I'd like to start by expressing my gratitude uh, to uh, Auckland Council for your ongoing support. Uh, the financial support given uh, to CNR um, through the ARAFA mechanism and Auckland Council uh, contributes to about 13% of our uh, annual expenses base. It's highly valued. It's uh, never taken for granted. It contributes to salary costs uh, for operations staff, uh, to the meeting the costs of our Auckland units, and uh, supports regional council, uh, sorry, regional community and education initiatives. Uh, in addition to the ARAFA grant, uh, I would also like to acknowledge the active support of council and councillors in many other ways through the course of the year. I see firsthand your support of our 13 northern region units, and I'm grateful to uh, councillors for what you do supporting our volunteers uh, to resolve local issues uh, and to drum up local support. It's very, very much appreciated. 
And finally, I'd like to say thank you um, uh, uh, to Council for your financial support uh, with the granting of $2 million towards the remediation of the Marine Rescue Centre. Uh, that project is progressing through the design process, uh, not quite as fast as we would like, but it is progressing. It is volunteer powered in the main, that project. Um, and the rescue centre, as you know, was purpose built uh, for not only our organisation, but several, others of, uh, several other resident organisations there. And while it continues to be our preferred location, it absolutely needs uh, investment. Um, and I'm grateful to you for uh, backing that. Uh, the role of Coast Guard Northern Region, as I think you know, is to make sure that everybody returns home safely uh, from their time in the water. Uh, more proactively and more positively, I think, uh, it's to enable our region's uh, residents to make the most of our amazing uh, coastline and marine environment. And we do so by providing uh, 365 day a year uh, rescue services, uh, by owning and operating uh, a comprehensive HF communications network across the Auckland uh, and Northland and Waikato regions, by providing mariners with information and services to keep them out of hot water, hopefully in the first place, and by educating uh, people in our communities so that they can make the most um, of our amazing marine environment. In the last 12 months, uh, it's been, well, the last 12 months has been a highly rewarding and challenging period for us. Uh, I believe we're delivering on a mission and executing on our strategy. Uh, in the period 2016 to 2018, uh, we've seen uh, the support we provide to boaties growing, uh, which is reversing a trend over the previous three years. Um, in the last full financial year, CNR managed about 114,000 trip reports uh, for boaties going out on the water. That's an increase of about 11,000 on the previous year. And we believe there is greater activity on the harbour. As you guys know, I think you own West Haven Marina, and you're probably aware that West Haven, West Haven Marina is pretty much full, as are most of the other uh, marinas uh, in our, in, in our uh, region. And we're seeing a lot of activity on boat ramps as well. The result of this is increased tasking uh, for Coast Guard. And last year, we responded to more than 2,100 uh, calls for assistance. We brought uh, more than 5,400 boaties uh, home uh, to safety one way or the other. And of those, about 260 events were genuinely life-threatening. The types of events that we uh, respond to vary very greatly across the region, uh, and our volunteers are trained for all sorts of eventualities. Uh, earlier this month, we were proud to be acknowledged at the NZ SAR Awards in Wellington uh, for one uh, typical kind of event. Uh, I won't go into too many of the details. I'll spare the, the, uh, the person the embarrassment, but it's fair to say uh, earlier, uh, well, last year, actually, uh, we found ourselves in a situation where uh, we were responding to an event where a boat owner was engulfed in a fireball on his yacht uh, when he decided to do uh, cleaning and electrical work uh, at the same time, which was a mistake. Uh, the crews of two Auckland Coast Guard rescue vessels uh, responded. Uh, we found this man very, very badly burnt uh, in the remnants of his yacht in the shower, suffering from hypothermia as well as severe burns. Uh, but thankfully, we were able to respond to administer pain relief and first aid and transfer him ashore uh, to, to hospital. This was quite a complex scenario and it's pretty typical, to be honest. We, uh, we undertook this event at night, uh, responding to a very badly damaged vessel with potential hazards, a patient with complex needs, uh, and as they all conducted in the dark. Uh, many of you will know that we operate an air patrol uh, based out of Ardmore. It's one of two air patrols that Coast Guard Northern Region operates. Uh, and in March this year, we uh, had an event that really typifies the difference it can make. Um, while fishing off Ariba, um, three friends in a boat uh, experienced um, the, uh, or had the experience rather, of having their boat sink on them. It sank inside 30 seconds. Uh, they managed to dash off a very quick May Day. Uh, and thankfully, we were able to pick it up. Uh, Coast Guard's uh, Auckland Air Patrol was in the vicinity. But unfortunately, they gave us a poor position uh, on uh, where they were. Uh, we were led to believe they were within 500 metres of the beach at Ariba. Uh, and once we had searched that location and discovered that wasn't where they were, 
we extended our search, our perimeter, if you like, and we found them three to four kilometers offshore. I often think about that. They had 30 seconds before their boat went down. They found themselves in the water, unable to see land at that point. And I can only imagine the relief that they must have experienced once the Coast Guard Air Patrol was over the top of them, um, uh, circling them uh, and getting a rescue vessel to their, to their uh, assistance. Uh, as you're aware, every year we deliver <coughs> excuse me, a broad range of community engagement and education activities to raise awareness of water safety and boating messages. Uh, in, the, in the current year, uh, we've delivered education to uh, in excess of 1,600 uh, students. Uh, we've also delivered seven bar safety courses across the region, uh, and we've attended events such as Pacific in the Park, um, Seaport, uh, to name just a couple. Again, this year, we've also undertaken our Old for New event that was started by Coast Guard Northern Region, uh, but has now spread uh, nationally. Each year, we're amazed by the response we get. Uh, this year, we've traded in excess of 3,400 life jackets uh, nationwide. Uh, on the 10th of May, Maritime New Zealand published the results of their No Excuses campaign, uh, in, uh, which is about enforcing and understanding life jacket uh, wearing uh, in or across New Zealand. Uh, they report that 95% of boaties surveyed uh, had sufficient life jackets on board and 83% of them were wearing them when required. And it's certainly been my observation as I go about my business now on the Hauraki Gulf uh, that uh, more often than not we see people wearing life jackets. So we do believe the message is getting through, uh, but it's, uh, it's a message we've got to continue to, uh, to spread. Uh, CNR is powered by approximately 1,000 volunteers. Uh, they're highly trained, uh, well equipped uh, to respond to the kinds of events that I've just been talking to you about. Uh, to uh, achieve a competence for volunteers and to stay competent, our volunteers typically put in about 15 hours a, a month uh, in discretionary effort. Uh, that's training, operations, or running their uh, volunteer units. In the main, Aucklanders are served well by Coast Guard. We have, as I said earlier, 13 units um, on the west and east coasts of this great city. However, there are outlying rural areas, uh, such as Kaipara and Barrier, uh, for example, where we do experience the challenges that many other voluntary organisations experience in terms of recruiting and retaining volunteers. This is a problem that we understand uh, we have a range of solutions for and are working very hard to address. We're doing so by improving our recruitment approaches, by increasing investment in training, by using technology uh, to give volunteers, or to take the burden uh, of admin of volunteers and give them better uh, decision-making tools. An example of this would be the use of the Active 911 app that we are now encouraging across the region. It allows volunteers to uh, tell us when they are responding to an event and enables them to understand in real time who is responding so that they can make well-informed decisions about whether they need to respond individually. Uh, this year, we have also recruited an additional two staff uh, into Coast Guard Northern Region to increase support to our units and to improve coordination uh, of our operations function. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, RAFA and to Auckland Council for giving us a financial contribution to this uh, when we requested it. Uh, this week, our Coast Guard crew are packing up after another successful and enjoyable Hutch Wilco uh, boat show up at the showgrounds. This is a huge uh, annual event for us when we get to engage with thousands of, uh, of, uh, of uh, boaties, if you like. Um, at this year's uh, boat show, I'm pleased to tell you that Coast Guard was awarded an innovation award for our Coast Guard app that we launched uh, last year. Uh, the app is an innovation designed to not only give people the information about weather and tide and, and such like, uh, but also to uh, provide them with an alternative, convenient way uh, to tell us what they're planning to do on the water if they don't want to use uh, the VHF or the telephone. And with the smartphone technology, we can also, of course, Big Brother-like, monitor their progress if they allow us to do so. Uh, and, and that gives us regular location information 
and we can also remind them uh, through the app to tell us when they're safely back uh, alongside. Uh, the app is just one of many technology projects we're deli we've delivered uh, in the last year uh, to improve the service that we provide to uh, Aucklanders. Uh, this month, we will complete a $1.5 million uh, investment uh, in our VHF communications system that will greatly improve uh, the quality, coverage and resilience of the system. We've done so in partnership with Cordia, uh, and in the process, we've put in place a service level, planned maintenance and systems monitoring on our network, which means that our systems will be better uh, and have less downtime. It also means that we now can reduce our reliance on hardware in the rescue centre, uh, which means that if we need to evacuate the rescue centre and operate from another location, we can now do so safely uh, and effectively. And finally, I will just quickly touch on our financial position. As you've heard, we're investing in our people and in necessary technology. As a result of that, our asset base, plants and equipment, if you like, is increasing. Uh, this, combined with recent changes to accounting rules, means that the shape of Coast Guard's financials are changing, I guess in the way that many um, not-for-profit financials are changing. Today, we need to increase our revenue uh, to rapidly, or to service our rapidly growing depreciation, where depreciation was less of an issue for not-for-profit organisations uh, in the past. And this is certainly presenting us with challenges, uh, not only in the way we manage our organisation, but also the way we tell our story about our financials. For the year ending June last year, CNR posted a consolidated surplus of $164,000 against revenue of about $5.5 million. We continue to work smartly to uh, grow and diversify our revenue and membership remains our single largest income source at about 40% of our income. As well as strengthening our fundraising capability uh, and seeking to establish long-term funding um, arrangements uh, with the likes of Trust by Cato, uh, Foundation North, etc. I will conclude by simply saying thank you to Council for your ongoing support, not just financially, but in, by all the other means that I've mentioned. Uh, and to be ready to answer any questions. Roy, is there anything you wish to say on behalf of the board? I'd certainly like to add my thanks to, to Auckland Council and the RAFA for, for supporting Coast Guard for many years. And uh, as Callum said, there's been some, some quite challenging technology projects that have added to the services um, that we've rolled out, and um, that the support's gratefully acknowledged. So that, that, that's it for me. All any right. questions, I'm welcome to, to answer. Okay. We'll go for Councillor Walker first. Commendations first on the fantastic work that you do, and thank you for the persons uh, or the rescue off uh, Ariwa, which is um, in our ward, myself and Councillor Watson. So, got a got a question. So, you mentioned that um, obviously the marinas are full, so boating activity is up, boat launching and the like. Have you got any 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 data on the increase in activity, which I'm assuming would correlate with the need for your service? It's, it's hard to get uh, accurate data. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, across New Zealand, there are about 600,000 uh, people who say they have boats, but they're of all different shapes and sizes, right? And from stand-up paddle boards through to, you know, to mega launches. Uh, the most accurate thing that we can do to uh, uh, give us a sense of activity is to look at that trip reporting information that we are we actively manage because that is a, a very effective measure of activity on the harbour. I can't give you a, a population number, for example, in terms of the number of Aucklanders uh, that are boating at the moment. There was a Becca study done a number of years back that some of you may you know be aware of. So, so when are you going to have some some trends and some and some data on that? because it's not been going long, correct? This is the trips, trip data? No, the trip data has been, has been going for a long time. For We're long very, time. We are very uh, confident in our trip um, reporting. I'm getting mixed up with the app that you've mentioned. Yes, sorry, the app has been going only since July last year. We've right. got about 13,000 downloads on that, okay. uh, and about 15% of the trip reports that we now receive are done through the app, which is great news for us. 
uh, because it uh, really adds a level of value in terms of being able to um, uh, send a text to you or, or sorry, uh, pursue you if you, uh, if you haven't closed your report, for example. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Simpson. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. That's got to be one of the best report back, reports back to Council I think I've ever heard, so congratulations on that. Um, my question is quite a simple one, is how do you let your people know that we fund you, that Auckland Council is one of the funders of the work, wonderful work that you do? Uh, we, first of all, have your branding on our website. It's in our annual report, uh, and we are out and proud about the support that you provide us. Councillor Watson. Thanks, and um, thank you for your, your heartfelt uh, expressions of gratitude too. It's, it's not that often that you, we in here hear people speak uh, so strongly in, in terms of uh, being grateful for what they receive from Council, so thank you for that. Um, my, my question goes to one of those statistics you, you quoted in respect of the life-threatening events, so over 260. Um, are you finding with the huge growth in population and certainly the massive increase in, in uh, well, in what I perceive as a massive increase in the number of boats utilising um, boat launching uh, areas. So, for instance, up in Gulf Harbour, him had absolutely chock-a-block. Uh, is there a degree of uh, inexperience or stupidity or uh, accompanying that, that increase, or, or are we finding, you know, the, the figures staying, you know, relatively static? Uh, one has to be careful about um, generalising about the people that we uh, seek to help. Uh, somebody said to me that the events at Ariwa were caused by a freak yep. wave. The yep. boat would have had a freeboard of about this much. It was maybe, you know, four or five metres long. It had three grown adults in it. There's lots of work to be done on education. Councillor Darby. Thanks, gentlemen. Yeah, good presentation. I appreciate it. And um, just following up on Councillor, oh, it was Councillor Simpson's query. Um, so what do Hutchwell Co, the grants, Lottery Grants Board and um, Lion Foundation, Pub Charity, what, what, do they, what do they contribute in terms of quantums just against ours? Absolutely, right. So um, uh, Auckland Council, uh, plus Northland and Waikato Council um, contribute about 13 to 14 percent of our expenses and the bulk of that is Auckland Council for the avoidance of any doubt. Uh, central government uh, to Coast Guard Northern Region and this, this varies with uh, the other regions so Eastern the other regions of Coast Guard have a higher dependence upon central government than uh, CNR does. Uh, central government provides about 10 to 11 percent of funding. Uh, we have, uh, we are the fortunate, uh, fortunate uh, beneficiaries of a two-year partnership with Foundation North. Foundation North this year have increased their funding per annum to Coast Guard Northern Region to $540,000 from $500,000. And that is invaluable for our capital funds to, to maintain and replace our rescue vessels. Uh, Lotteries Grant Board and uh, Lotteries Grant Board typically contribute between one hundred and fifty and perhaps four hundred thousand dollars a year uh, to Coast Guard Northern Region, and that varies depending on on the types of projects that we're asking for. Hutch Wilco are an amazing partner. They've been with us for a very very long time. They are they provide us twenty thousand dollars a year in in kind support, so life jackets uh, that we then uh, use at, at the likes of the boat show for promotions, and they are also. Uh, the, one of the big powers behind the Old for New Life Jacket campaign across the country. So we, uh, we have a great relationship with him. Okay, thank you. Um, and so just given there's a range of quantums there and, um, and, and generous organisations they are, I'm looking at your website. It's something I have raised before. I just can't see the acknowledgement of Auckland Council on your website. I mean, that's a portal where a lot of your members and maybe 
users who aren't uh, members would go to inquire. And um, Vern, really, um, it's probably something for you, Vern. I, I always thought that there needed to be chair and acknowledgement. Am I, miss am I missing it? Is it an oversight? Because I did raise it a year ago, and I think a year ago prior. Is it, is it there, but I can't see it, or is it something to attend to? I think, I, as, as, <coughs> as I said, uh, it's not. We we can do better on the website. You're right. We have the we have the Auckland Council brands there. Um, uh, we uh, presume you're looking at the right website, the, the Coast Guard Northern Region website, as opposed to the Coast Guard New Zealand website. Coast Guard Auckland. I'm on the Coast Guard Auckland. That's not the correct website. That's that's the Coast Guard unit in Auckland at the at the rescue centre. I'm representing Coast Guard Northern Region. That, and that is different again. Okay. No, and, and, and regrettably, Coast Guard Northern Region is one of 68 Coast Guard entities uh, in New Zealand. So uh, we are a federated model. A number of them have websites. Uh, CNR has the Auckland brand on its website uh, and uh, has your brand in our annual report, a copy of which I have with me here. Yep. And as I said to... I think it was Councillor Simpson. Um, I am very vocal about the support you provide. I stand corrected and apologise. Yes, you have got the Auckland brand there along with another number of others, and yeah. thank you. And so the, the yeah. app, the Coast Guard app, just to get that right, yes. that's not your app, that's the national app? It's, 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 it's a national app, provides a national service. Um, we're taking trip reports from um, uh, the South Island, uh, but it was created by my team and I. Okay, and so that's a, I, I just looked, that's a paid app. I wasn't aware of it. It's it is. A, it's $3.49, Mr. Darby. Yep. Yeah. And just in terms of uh, cost recovery, uh, you know, having been a Bodie and seen the number of, uh, you know, towbacks to base because people run out of fuel or whatever reason it is, you know, things that as a Bodie you should be on top of yep. and you guys deal with it because the wind's blowing the wrong way and yep. all those arguments. So, um, I like the ambulance service, and it's a donation request, really. Um, do you make requests of people who aren't members uh, and recover costs there? Uh, uh, yes, so there are a couple of things to, to understand. The first of all, uh, first of all, we're a search and rescue organisation. So, in the event that you are in a life-threatening position, such as either of the two uh, uh, examples I've given this morning, there's no uh, there's no invoice given to you as you climb in the ambulance. It's free. All right, and that's provided to you. Uh, that cost is covered by either police or by the rescue coordination centre or ambulance. Uh, for non-life-threatening events, um, uh, if you are a member, the cost of recovery is free. If you are not a member and you choose to go out and take that risk and you find yourself with a flat battery, uh, then Coast Guard will charge you $280 an hour uh, by way of cost recovery uh, for that. And we have about an 80% 80, 80 cost recovery success rate. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Casey and then Councillor Cashmore. Thanks very much, uh, Callum and Roy. It's, um, I'd like to echo Councillor Simpson's praise of this presentation. Um, done in plain English without the need for visual aids. It's very rare at this council, so congratulations. My question relates to the Marine Rescue Centre and its timeline and also the America's Cup, which is going to be a big year for you and when we can expect you to come or through through Arafa looking for more money to service America's Cup and how is the planning going for that? I like to pride myself on always delivering in plain Scottish, Councillor Casey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so, in terms of the rescue centre project, uh, that's a project that is run by the trust uh, that oversees the rescue centre, not by CNR or, or Surf Life Saving uh, uh, here today. Uh, that's being managed by, by the trust. Uh, they are on a timeline to have that completed realistically in about 18 months' time. Uh, they are currently working through the detailed design process uh, with RGT Pacific, who are the uh, architects doing that. Uh, there is certainly the need to increase uh, funding further to support that, but the council's contribution of $2 million 
uh, really gives them a foundational uh, position from which to, to build that, uh, that funding uh, ask, if you like. Uh, in terms of the America's Cup, there's two things to say. The first one is that Coast Guard uh, is working with America's, uh, with Emirates Team New Zealand and has been in receipt of a promise, and a partnership, if you like, from Lottery's Grant Board uh, for $10 million uh, for the purchase of 26 uh, chase stroke rescue boats that will be used during the uh, AC36 campaign and then will be uh, repurposed and used by Coast Guard units around the country. Uh, and, uh, of course, the America's Cup is going to be a big thing uh, going off uh, here in, in 2021. Uh, Coast Guard Northern Region will get involved on the periphery of the operation, if you like, but we have no um, uh, requested a role to play in the America's Cup uh, organisation or execution. Councillor Cashmore. Thanks, Mr Chair. Yeah, well, well done, gentlemen. Um, my question is to you about your finances. So you, you alluded to the fact that there's going to be some shortfall during the thing, you're going to have to fund appreciation more thoroughly going forward. Um, are you able to account with that in the existing structures or will you be looking for more money from your um, funders? Uh, we aim to account for that uh, ourselves. Uh, I think the fact of the matter is that we are under a fair bit of pressure, uh, uh, particularly in terms of supporting our volunteers and uh, in dealing with both a backlog of technology that needs upgraded uh, and the ex I guess the expectations of yourself and ourselves in terms of making sure that we have the right technology to provide the right services to people. So we, don't, we do not expect to stop our technology investment. At the board meeting that Roy and I attended last night, uh, we talked about the fact that we may have to, to carefully manage that uh, depreciation um, about wave that we're now experiencing. Uh, five years ago, CNR was uh, managing depreciation of about $128,000 a year. Uh, that is now more likely to be $600,000 this year which means that our, uh, our net profit has to be that or better in order uh, to manage uh, our accounting profit. We are working very closely with Coast Guard New Zealand uh, to engage in conversation with government about uh, perhaps simplifying the structure of our organisation and gaining additional funding from them. Um, perhaps. Councillor Cashmore, if I can add to that, just to give some, some colour around the, the sort of projects that uh, the project costs we're incurring that result in these, uh, the escalation of depreciation over time. So a lot of it is around the, the computer systems and software that are needed to ensure uh, health and safety standards uh, meet expectations and requirements um, going forward. Um, also partly to do with our training and education. As we're trying to include more people in Coast Guard and get a more diverse base coming through, the way they learn has changed. So instead of a classroom situation with, with a lecture and a, and a test afterwards, it's, it's more online, it's more computer driven. So the appreciation, it's, it's, it's not just boats, motors, aircraft, that sort of thing, it's, it, it's systems, it's, it's, um, it's a new radio rollout, it's, it's the development in the app. So part of the challenge is just the timing of that depreciation versus the life of the expense incurred, and um, it, it's something we're very focused on. Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Mr Chair, and through you, thank you for your presentation. I just want to pick up on your comments about the need for more education. Is that something that you'll be uh, looking to undertake outside of your membership, or are you advocating to others to, to undertake that education? <clears throat> Uh, water safety education in Auckland is, is a pretty, um, I was going to say crowded market in a sense. There are many different organisations doing that. Um, Coast Guard Northern Region is responsible for, if you like, the frontline delivery of search and rescue services. Uh, we are uh, uh, supported by Coast Guard Boating Education uh, as well, who are based uh, at the West Haven Marina. Uh, so, collectively, Coast Guard uh, is delivering a lot of specifically boating safety um, uh, 
uh, events and community engagement. This year we went to Pacific in the Park for the first time uh, and have gone to seaports for, I think, the second time this year. So we are increasing our community engagement. We have been in receipt of additional funding from Foundation North to uh, work on our diversity and community engagement strategy because uh, I believe that Foundation North do a good job of that and that we can learn from them and they've been generous enough to give us funding towards helping that. Uh, in addition to that, this year we have uh, continued and we plan to grow our schools programme. Uh, uh, for example, during, uh, I think it was the summer term, uh, Auckland Grammar uh, had kids come through for two weeks of uh, marine education as part of an NCA qualification. And we're looking to see if we can expand that. But that is dependent upon when the schools want to, to be involved with that kind of stuff. The Old for New campaign is huge, not only in terms of uh, trading life jackets, but the, but the educational uh, and engagement part of that as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that answers, answers it. Are you saying that it's a particular group that are drowning? No, it's not a particular group that are drowning. Um, I can say absolutely that uh, Maori, Pacifica and Asian uh, uh, communities drown uh, at a higher pro rata uh, uh, percentage than uh, people like myself. Right. Um, Callum, we were talking earlier about the boat at Titarangi, the new boat which will get across the bar. What, what are the abilities of Raglan or Kaipara or Waiuku with regards to getting boats across the bar? Are they all capable of that or is only Titarangi, I mean, this Councillor Cashmore will be interested in this and, and Hulse, Councillor yeah. Hulse and Cooper. Manukau Harbour is a really busy harbour, as, as you know. We've got three Coast Guard units on the Manukau yeah. uh, at Waiuku, Papakura and Titarangi. Uh, both the Waiuku and the Papakura uh, rescue uh, teams are very well equipped with bar-capable oh, rescue boats. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Titarangi one uh, hasn't been so well equipped since it went under the French Bay Yacht Club. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but the one that we're purchasing now will be bar-capable. Okay. Uh, all of the units at Raglan and Kaipara are being bar-capable. Okay. Right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I think very good presentation. We, we, we don't have the funds in Titarangi, <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> so thank you, gentlemen, that was really good. Very good uh, presentation and, uh, and yeah, we will do a vote of thanks at the end after we have um, surf life savings. So thank you, Roy, thank you, Callum. Right, Matt, Matthew. Welcome, Matthew. Good morning, councillors. Uh, just before we kick off formally, I might correct the record. Uh, Matthew Williams, Chief Executive, Surf Life Saving Northern Region. Unless you all know something I don't know at this stage. Uh, okay. Northern Region. Oh, New Zealand. Oh, yeah. Denied. Yep. Uh, uh, <laughs> Denied. Uh, also, apologies from our chair, Denise Boviard. She enjoys coming along to these engagements, but is currently out of town and we couldn't find a board replacement. So uh, she regrets she's here, and I regret the increased word count. <laughs> the history of surf lifesaving in Auckland region is well understood. Many of the councillors here today have had a direct engagement through our clubs, through our regional events, or through uh, attending and visiting our beaches. The past year has once again been a successful one for surf lifesaving northern region, especially in the Auckland area. Data collected through the 2018 Coastal Research Analysis led by our national body SLSNZ has provided key information to Surf Life Saving Northern Region about the times and dates members of the public are accessing our patrolled beaches in Auckland. Auckland member clubs were supported to use this data to extend and add to their current patrol times and dates to ensure Surf Life Saving was working to match patrol coverage to beach usage within reason. This change has had a significant impact on the injury toll in the first year. Provisional figures from the season ended late April 2019 has shown that this increase in patrolling hours by approximately 15% has reduced the total number of significant rescues where if we hadn't assisted someone may have dr uh, drowned or died 
down to 177 people, down from last year's average of 253 people and a 23% decrease on the 10-year average for Auckland. In summation, despite being one of the busiest summers on Auckland beaches, Auckland lifeguards were able to have a significant impact on the drowning and injury toll by increasing the voluntary and paid patrol times and hours. This year also saw the successful implementation of the St John MDT tasking unit. Recent years have seen frustrations caused by emergency services not tasking surf lifesaving to appropriate incidents at appropriate times. Their operations have simply not accounted for surf lifesaving formally. What this has meant is that outside of patrol hours, if incidents are occurring at times St John staff have responded through the 111 line to a drowning, they don't have a practical ability to respond to, and surf lifesaving have only been reflex tasked at a later stage, often at such a late stage that we are not able to successfully respond to the victim. To address this, Surf Life Saving Northern Region and Coast Guard Northern Region partner with St John to install their MDT unit in the Coast Guard Operations Centre in the Marine Rescue Centre. This has been an immediate success, with Surf Life Saving Northern Region responding to an additional 64 jobs where we have had greater impact to avoid serious injury and save a life. It would also be interesting to note for Council that Aucklanders are fast becoming better educated and more beach safe, although the population is growing and using the beach in different ways. We're seeing far more incident caused by uh, uneducated beachgoers or people not assessing the risk. And, and what we're now faced with in Auckland, which is slightly more constant, uh, complicated, is we have a very wide range of drowning incidents with a slim frequency in that. So it's sort of 20 ways people are getting in trouble with only one of two people in those 20 categories, which is more complex to address than 100 people getting in trouble in a certain way. Continuing the theme of partnership, Auckland Council and Surf Life Saving Northern Region continue to work closely together through the joint partnership with Auckland District Health Board, the Safe Swim platform. This resource continues to be upgraded to better serve Auckland and now contains key safety information for beaches and live hazard updates to ensure it is a relevant one-stop shop for coastal recreation information. Additionally, Safe Swim and Water Quality Education now forms part of all of our beach education and junior surf curriculum taught in primary schools around Auckland and to our youth membership known as Nippers or Cadets. It is exciting to note that Safe Swim funding has supported Surf Life Saving Northern Region in working with Plymouth University on a first of its kind RIP modelling and forecast tool that will provide real time and predictive RIP and surf conditions forecasting to Auckland beachgoers, further strengthening the Safe Swim platform and securing it as a world class coastal and beach information tool supporting resilient communities in Auckland and greatly assisting Surf Life Saving Northern Region in delivering the education pillar of our drowning prevention strategy. Finally, significant capital investment projects under the radio network upgrade. Uh, in the first year ahead of schedule, we've completed our entire region's radio digital network upgrade and we came in 20% below budget and we had our first season using that new digital network and uh, it's been performing well in that space. None of this great work could be achieved without the continued support of Auckland Council. Through the annual array for grant and the support of our SURF 1020 capital redevelopments, Auckland Council is the largest single funder of surf lifesaving services nationally, coming in ahead of significant community funders such as NZLGB. That contribution is appreciated and ensures that Auckland has a world-class lifesaving service as we work to make some of the most dangerous and populated beaches in the country safe and enjoyable to recreate at for anyone. Surf Life Saving Northern Region is looking to continue its history of success. Though it is less clear and understood what the future of surf life saving delivery will look like in Auckland over the next 20 years. Council and Surf Life Saving Northern Region must continue to work together to agree what will be required to respond to a changing, more complex community and volunteer network. Population growth, urban sprawl, sprawl, societal change, a dynamic demographic mix and heightened mobility will continue to increase and vary the demands on our services in the Auckland area. In the last four years, Surf Life Saving Northern Region has taken early steps to be future focused creating new means to address funding requirements, providing services at new locations where there is demonstrable demand, increasing patrol times to ensure the public has supervised access to the beach at peak times, 
critically reviewing historical arrangements, including patrol locations. Senior lifeguards regularly working closely with the wider emergency services framework. Highly trained senior lifeguards operating across the Auckland area in support of major incidents, supporting volunteers, and ensuring appropriate health and safety protocols are observed. Creating strategic and future-focused roles at staff level with a mandate to build relationships with the central government and other key external stakeholders. Establishing a separate Lifesavers Foundation that is looking globally for fundraising, altruism and philanthropy best practice with a view to shifting the funding burden from our surf club members and diversifying revenue streams wider than local government. Coordinating a long-term plan for the provision of buildings and other major infrastructure. Conducting a comprehensive beach safety risk assessment of all Auckland region to ensure an evidence-based approach is delivered for our services. Despite these strategic initiatives, to ensure we are well placed to respond to future challenges, our strategic plan contemplates some key challenges that I'd like to share with Council. The nature of our work and the structure of our organisation brings with it significant legacy challenges which the organisation has been working to address. These challenges are principally inherited and endemic within the sector as a whole, many of which have burdened the organisation for decades, our legacy challenges. Principle of which is that surf lifesaving is largely in the commons. Everyone uses our service, everyone believes they have a right to the service, but no one is responsible for supporting or providing the service and we can't attract revenue from that service. In New Zealand, no one authority is responsible for the funding, support or success of our organisation and the legislation surrounding coastal management and the use of the beaches is largely silent around how local authorities or central government should provide for us. This has resulted in surf lifesaving being burdened with some antiquated systems, which at times frustrates all levels. We're well supported in the funding of our core services, but the organisation has not been successful in supporting the uh, ancillary support systems from membership organisation, which, which would make us truly thrive. Surf lifesaving is also adapting to deal with the changing volunteer landscape. SLS and I has achieved its current status largely due to strong philanthropic support and the huge amounts of volunteer time and effort that have been committed to making sure this organisation remains successful. And it would be a fair representation to say we largely got where we are as an organisation based on our volunteers' strength and tenacity alone, sheer force of will and key volunteers putting in a huge amount of effort. The present day volunteer landscape no longer supports volunteers being able to give their time so freely and what was the expected norm for volunteer commitment is no longer feasible, yet alone attractive. There's also far more rigmarole, process and structure around volunteering and providing the equivalent services of the past. Though these processes and functions are for good cause, it has had the ancillary impact of adding an increasing amount of workload, planning and cost to deliver similar levels of service. This additional burden has made it increasingly harder to find people who can support volunteer commitments in the current format and severely limits our volunteer profile and future performance, which leaves us with the dual challenges of growing the delivery of volunteer services at times when volunteers have less time and resource. Uh, Life-saving facilities, rescue equipment and human resources. While our core operations have been adequately funded over time, support for capital investment has been ad hoc and at times less than what was forecast or needed. In regards to our 10 surf life-saving facilities across Auckland, which has Cornerstone Council funding support, this has meant that many of them are currently in urgent need of repair and rebuild at the same time. While this shows incredibly poor previous planning on the part of the organisation, it is now firmly this generation's responsibility to respond to the crisis. The average age of these facilities is 32 years old, and many of them are now no longer fit for purpose, let alone able to support the future needs of our growing member clubs. SURF 1020, the programme and governance group set up to address this problem, has been slow to progress outcomes. Without criticism, it has taken approximately twice as long as anticipated to reach each milestone, and this is despite significant and growing support and resource from Auckland Council. To rebuild these buildings in such an escalated construction market in such a challenging environment is quickly debilitating an already laboured workforce. Project complexities and standard consenting issues abound, and current funding forecasts do not match the project expenditure, with many funders already supporting surf lifesaving or the clubs in other capacities. 
It is frustrating to note that progress has been so slow, despite a concerted effort by a talented array of volunteers, and these frustrations now palpable within the movement. Nevertheless, we have to be successful in this endeavor, and as we know how critical the program is to the movement. It is hoped that the future prospect of central government funding will arrive in a timely enough manner to support the bulk of these developments. Whether as a result of the changing volunteer landscape or current culture and practices, we also have a membership deficiency in comparatively, comparatively in members aged 23 to 41 across the region and somewhat adversarial leadership within some of our member organisations. Necessary change, which must come, is seen as uh, threatening or destructive by these entities and we must do more to move forward as one organisation in future years. Additional to the above, our participation or membership model is no longer deemed fit for purpose and will need to be reviewed to support the future needs of Auckland. The Waiheke Local Board and Community has a desire to partner with Surf Lifesaving and form part of the movement, teaching their youth valuable skills, not desiring to put up flags on the beach, but they want to make sure that their community can respond to a rescue successfully. It's a reasonable ask and a sensible way to grow our service delivery. However, our current constitution and membership model allows no way for existing community groups who want to work with us to do this easily and help us achieve our mission and vision. This is not acceptable and needs to be remedied. These legacy challenges have largely been business as usual items for surf lifesaving in the past decade and would be symptomatic to many organisations of our kind throughout New Zealand. However, it is fair to say in the past we have largely got by and succeeded in spite of being burdened by these challenges. However, in the face of future challenges, it is clear that we must conclusively address these matters if we are able to perform in our predicted future environment. In concert with the listed legacy challenges, Surf Life Saving Northern Region's current strategic plan has anticipated additional independent challenges we will need to address in order to achieve our vision and uh, mission in the future. Front and centre center in Auckland is population growth and sprawl. sprawl. The population growth continues more people continue to come to the city and use the beaches, and these additional beach users are using the beach in new and varying ways. That's to say, anecdotally, it's not just 100 new people on the beach, it's 100 new people at new times doing completely different things to what they had done in the past, all of which demands a more complex and varied response from our volunteers. This in turn means the basket of skills lifeguards require is continuing to grow more and become more in-depth and multifarious at the same time. Amplifying this population growth in coastal recreation is occurring in new coastal areas in Auckland that do not currently have access to surf lifesaving services. Where once there was one house, now there may be hundreds or thousands. This is a significant strategic challenge as it requires the organisation to engage early with council and communities to ensure we are working in partnership delivering new services where they are needed and that current services are still relevant in light of population change and demand. Ultimately, surf lifesaving must work towards a model that we respond to the planning needs of current and burgeoning settlements and not drownings or injury which occur further down the timeline. Examples of this are seen at Wenderholm, Parkery, Goat Island, TRI and neighbouring black swamps. Additionally, conversations may require surf lifesaving to reconfigure its service delivery in the future, which is difficult when the service is driven by an affiliation to the current coastline where the surf club has historically been based. These population changes will almost certainly require surf lifesaving to review its systems, processes and engagement models to ensure we are attracting and developing membership in these new areas, and these changes will need to be widely consulted with our current membership and external stakeholders. Is it much no, more because uh, we want to allow for questions, that's all. I think before we finish, it would also be right to thank the ARAFA board for their leadership in this space, and especially Vern Walsh, uh, really strong support from that board and leadership from Vern. It's a, it's a difficult time, at part, uh, difficult job at times, balancing the needs of two uh, very vocal stakeholders, so we'd like to thank them for that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Matthew. Councillor Walker. A couple of questions. Um, the last one, just picking up on the point that you've made around these distant locations, and uh, I'm referring to particularly Parkery, Black Swamp, um, Tierra. My, um, my son serves there, for example, and he's concerned sometimes about the, you know, the absence. So how how can you resource that? But that that's a great question. We'll talk about Parkery to start with. 
Parkery Beach has a life-saving service there because Red Beach Surf Lifesaving Club set one up there six years ago. Yeah. That involves volunteers driving every weekend from Red Beach an hour and a half up the coast to set up patrol by 10 o'clock, providing the patrol and driving an hour and a half back. It's a model that becomes less and less valuable over time. And the longer they're there, the more their costs increase as they have more capital infrastructure patrol towers. It needs to be planned at the outset. And what we've proposed is that we have now completed a, a fulsome report on Auckland coastal recreation use, uh, and it's showing where people are likely to use the beaches in the future and where they're using it now. And we're going to use that to work through with our membership and then Auckland Council to decide where the services may be needed and how we're actually going to resource those memberships. And the added challenge, as I alluded to, was that many of these clubs, such as Marangi Bay, have an affiliation to their coastline. They may have a strong membership, a membership in surplus of the need for the service in that area, but we need to work with them to ensure that that resource being their lifeguards is able to be used to serve the other areas of Auckland and to supplement that with growing an additional surf lifeguards. What we don't want to do is be building new surf lifesaving towers or surf lifesaving facilities, so we'd have uh, clip-on services, and we don't want to be adding uh, incorporated societies to the membership. Sure. Just got one other very quick question, and that is my observation and what people tell me is you've got a significant impact to, on of technology. So you've now got uh, motorised surfboards that are coming out and obviously kite servers and um, some of these things have got foils and, and they're motorised, highly dangerous. Uh, there appears to be a significant escalation in all this. It means that people can go further out a lot quicker and get into trouble. Is this something you're keeping abreast of? Yeah, that's correct. As we've said in the report, we're having a more complex and multifarious response uh, as people use the coastline in new ways. The other challenge is that uh, in, in the past, surfers would come to the beach who knew how to surf. Surfboards and similar equipment are now so available and so readily used. There's less stigma about being a learner that you're having a lot of people come to the beach and learn in what is essentially a dangerous environment without instruction, which either relies on the local surfing community supporting them or surf life saving providing a response. So we're seeing a complexity in our patrol response. But again, we've been really successful in responding to that space. It becomes more and more challenging, but we continue to decrease the drowning toll. We continue to qualify more lifeguards, and our beaches continue to be safer. Councillor Casey. Oh, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Matthew, for a very good presentation, as usual. Um, my question um, goes to your comments on the <coughs> provision of uh, life-saving services. And I, I think a number of these clubs now in the northern region which have massive memberships, I mean, huge memberships, in some cases, uh, you know, poor or inadequate facilities to cater for that membership. Is there a correlation between those huge memberships in areas that are growing and a, a flow on to, to, to people wanting to be lifeguards and therefore the ability perhaps to go to some of these far flung places like, like Red Beach does or is, that, is the, or, or is that sort of wishful thinking? Correct, so you're diving into one of our strategic priorities which is matching the lifeguard capability to where the need is. And of course there's going to have to be some negotiation in that because uh, I think it's far easier for the Marangi Bay lifeguard to patrol at Marangi Bay or the Piha lifeguard to patrol at Piha as it is for them to cross the coast. And of course there's added cost in that, so we're now reviewing our options in that space. You are right that the membership, especially in the East Coast urban clubs, continues to grow, and some of them are upwards of 700. Uh, Oriwa sits at 900 and Red Beach sits at 600 with Oriwa at 700, so very strong membership. But that membership adds as much burden to the club as they work as volunteers to support such a strong group with, without the national support you'd see from other uh, organisations such as soccer or rugby from that size. So we look to work with them to manage that growth and to make sure that they use other nearby surf clubs if they can't meet the demands of their community in terms of membership. Matthew, in your report, you did refer to um, adversarial leadership in some areas, and I don't want to go there. But we have got three surf clubs that... Uh... ...region board of the elected governance of that board. In the case of the rebuilds, Carrie, Carrie, I think, portrays some of the challenges we're seeing. They're in a very difficult build environment. Yeah. 
they're competing with uh, escalating construction market. Their costs have gone up some, I think, 33% over two years. That's just the facts, you know, they've got to live with that. And at the same time, the same individuals who are trying to run the club and patrol a dangerous beach, as Carry Carry being a thin community with not a lot of resource, are trying to do this mammoth task of rebuilding a $4 million surf club with support from Northern Region and Auckland Council. And it's a difficult task. At the same time, it's a competitive funding environment. We have the likes of Marine Rescue Centre Trust trying to be rebuilt at the same time, so we're talking to the same funders. We have funders that fund them operationally who are now being gone to for CAPEX support. And what we've looked to and where we've been quite vocal in the past is that the local funding market in Auckland has been tapped out for that. Auckland Council is funding at a maximum. Their support is, uh, I think, monumental, uh, considering when you look at what central government gives, which is nothing, and what other funders give. And we're now really pressing the national body to advance conversations with the central government. I think it's criminal that it still hasn't happened at this time. And we put the ultimatum to them last year that if the central, if the national body wasn't going to approach central government, we had a very strong case too. And we're now looking to be involved in future budgets, but we just cannot progress that quick enough, I think, to have additional support. And do you advise certain cl you know, clubs that where a new surf club is out of control because of escalation costs that, you know, potentially um, rebuilds on old bones is a good way to go about it and half the price or something like that. Really good question. Uh, surf Life Saving Northern Region, through myself as facilitator of the 1020 project, has overall program and project governance, which puts me in the difficult position of managing their aspirations. And they'd love to have buildings with curved glass and $8 million bills, but there's simply not funding for that. So we need to make sure that they're practical builds, that there's uniformity, because all surf clubs in Auckland really should look the same, and that they're able to actually have clubs which they can maintain the OPEX for, and at the same time they need to have a club that's built for what the club's going to look like in 40 years, not what it looks like today. Yep. So it often sometimes puts us at loggerheads, but they're worthwhile conversations. Right, thank you. Good answer. Councillor Hulse, do you, uh, wrap it up. Thank you. And I guess from those of us who represent the West, Huge thanks, as always, and just acknowledging the work that Councillor Cooper's done with you on the um, the rebuild project. My question was actually going to cover off the relationship with central government because we are tapped out, as you say quite rightly, as a community and as a council, and I agree. I think it is a dereliction of duty that successive governments have not engaged in this discussion. When you look at the rate of rescue in places like Piha and Karikari, this is a life-saving first response. Um, it's not a, a sports club. And I just, I guess the question had been partially answered, but it's again to offer our support to any endeavours that you may require and support to central government. And again, thank you for the thousands of life-saving rescues. Thank you. And I think to be clear to Council, the response on the East Coast is just as much. There's a huge demand for surf lifesaving on both coasts. But we are an emergency service, we are a sports club, and we are a community education arm. We fill multiple roles successfully. Although it has its challenges, we fulfil all those spots. Right. Thank you very much. That's very, um, very thorough. And um, someone could move a vote of thanks to, to Matthew and the other two organisations, Councillor Watson, Councillor Fletcher. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, none against, obviously. Uh, thank you, Watercare, for turning up at 11.30. We are going to take a five-minute break. I'm afraid we've been going since 9 o'clock. So. Mr. Mr. Chairman, just, yes. just before we move on, I'm mindful that this may be the last time that we see Vern Walsh. Uh, I think we're seeing Vern one more time. Uh, oh, that's right. As, as much as we'd like to see him many more times, but I think we're seeing him uh, June, uh, end of June, I think, yes. All right, thank you.